So this session was initially, initially called Should Surgeons Be Interested in the Effects of Bypass? And I don't know about you guys, but when I go into theatre, I don't even think about what's going to happen with the bypass machine. I just go in, the cannulation's been done, I say go on bypass, and I don't even think about it. That's until something goes wrong, and then I suddenly become very interested in the effects of bypass and how long it's going to last and what the perfusion pressure is and where we're oxygenated and whether the patient's going to have a stroke. So I, I renamed it, should we worry about the effects of bypass, because that's basically what we're, I mean, we're using the bypass to support the patient, but actually we're worried all the time about the effects the bypass has on the patient. So my initial comment is we don't worry about it, but we should worry about it. Now, bypass is safe, and I'll reiterate, reiterate that. Bypass is safe, but the perceptions linger. Um, if you speak to any cardiologist, they always say, oh, can you do this off bypass because we don't want the patient to have bypass? Well, that doesn't make sense because bypass is perfectly safe and I have yet to see any convincing evidence that doing a procedure off pump is any safer than doing it on pump. And again, the TAVI cardiologists, they want to do the TAVIs because it avoids bypass. Again, that's rubbish. You know, it's perfectly safe doing an aortic valve replacement on bypass. And if those of you who've ever tried to do a transapical TAVI with the cardiologists, um, there's no reversal of heparin and everything's bleeding and the pe pressure's up and down and there's complete loss of control and your purse string goes in the apex and there's blood squirting out all everywhere. H how can that be safer than doing it on bypass? So again, I think this perception, it, this perception that bypass is not safe is just being um, perpetuated all the time. Okay, I'll just wait for that lady to vote. But it has, bypass initially was not safe, and I was just going to go through some of the crazy inventions that you think these were only 50, 60 years ago, but actually if they'd been done today, you'd be struck off if you'd tried to do this to a patient. So in the beginning, back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, there were various ingenious operations like sort of doing shunts and doing um, <coughs> pulmonary artery bandings. And then people tried cooling the patient where they'd sort of stick them in an ice bath, wait till they went isostolic, very quickly did what they had to do and then massaged them back while they were rewarming. And again, that didn't really catch on when, when you think you probably only did those operations when the patient were at a very advanced stage of their disease. It's no wonder it really didn't catch on. And then the other crazy thing they did was to uh, suture a sort of cone onto the right atrium and try and close the ASD through a bucket of blood um, with a patient with right heart failure who had advanced um, progression of their ASD with pulmonary hypertension. And again, you can imagine the very worst cases had the very highest um, oh, mortality. Yeah. Sorry, I can't compete with her. So people were tasked with trying to develop some sort of cardiac support. So they, all, they needed three things. They needed anticoagulation, they needed a pump, and they needed some way to oxygenate the, the, um, the blood. So anticoagulation wasn't a problem. Um, heparin was well known about and a very effective uh, anticoagulant. What they didn't have was protamine, so they couldn't reverse it. A pump readily available. Um, you know, in those days they had sewing machines, they had drills, they had all sorts of things, so getting a pump wasn't a problem. And then trying to oxygenate the blood, uh, that's where um, people really had a bit of a problem. So this chap is Dr. Mustard of the Mustard um, operation, and he came up with this pump here. Well, it, I would call it a pump in the loosest um, sense of the word, it's, it's a contraption. And this, um, I'm, do I have a pointer? No, um, it doesn't work. But at, at the top where those glass cylinders are, um, he would perfuse the blood through a pair of rhesus monkey lungs that were being ventilated at the same time. And you can imagine that, that didn't work very well. He couldn't actually get a patient to survive with that. So they dropped that very quickly. Then came Dr. Gibbon, and he, he sort of took a slightly more scientific approach to it and actually did get a patient to survive. And I think he operated on 
six patients, it might, might not have been as many as that, and with one long-term survivor, but he came, became slightly disillusioned with it. But he is credited as the first person to really put cardiopulmonary bypass on the map. Then there were other slightly strange things that you could think, well, they were for good sound um, physiological reasons. This guy is uh, Dr. Lillehei, uh, again from America, who came up with the concept of using, this is for pediatric surgery, and he would use one of the parents <coughs> as the oxygenator and part of the pump, so that there'd be cross-circulation between the adult and the child. And again, it's one of the few operations where there could be a 200% mortality, <clears throat> and it, indeed there was. And this, this sort of went down... Oh, this woman's starting to really annoy me now. Can, can we shut that door at the back, please? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, th this was a sort of blind alley in terms of circulatory support because it only <clears throat> it, it couldn't be between adult and adult, clearly. Um, it could only be adult and child. And again, if you look at the figures, yes, they had some spectacular results, but the mortality was in the uh, order of 30, 40 percent. And you can imagine how well that would go down in the uh, United Kingdom these days you'd be struck off. So again, um, they went back to um, looking at the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. And one of these guys is Vincent Gott. I don't know which one it is, but they came up with the concept of the bubble oxygenator, where they basically just bubbled oxygen through um, deoxygenated blood. And again, that was good for oxygenation, but it wasn't terribly good for the patient because of gaseous embolus. Um, <clears throat> And they came up with a, I mean, the um, device to the left was not disposable. It had to be cleaned out every time. The device to the right was a disposable um, um, mechanism. And again, further, this is Kirkland's device. Um, and again, there's a, a rotating disc um, effort on the right-hand side, where basically the discs just pulled up the blood and like a washing machine and blood uh, oxygen was blown through it. So things, things began to develop, and in the sort of 60s and 70s, things got safer. And I mean, in, the, in the British Isles, I'll just put a shout out for the Hammersmith Hospital. This guy is Mr. Melrose, uh, Dennis Melrose, and he's, I mean, he, he did a lot of work on um, cardiopulmonary bypass in the 60s at the Hammersmith, but he's credited for the first guy to use cardioplegia in the world. I don't think he's got enough uh, recognition for that, but he, he was the first one. And this is the Hammersmith Hospital on a sunny day, so it doesn't happen very often. But the, the initial developments, things got safer, membrane oxygenators instead of bubble oxygenators. I mean, in the olden days, again, if you can, you know, for the younger surgeons, um, the patients used, to, there'd be two patients on the list and they'd both have the same blood group and you'd use the bypass machine for one patient and then you'd just wheel it through without cleaning it, same prime or what have you, same blood in it, and use it on the second patient. Couldn't do that now, it would be unthinkable. So oxygenation was sorted out, filters were put in, bubble detectors, <coughs> bio-coating of circuits, pulse tile flow, but perhaps the most important um, development during the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s was the development of perfusion science and perfusionists, so a group of people who actually understood the bypass machine, because I, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll sort of uh, throw this out here, that a lot of surgeons don't actually fully appreciate what goes on with cardiopulmonary bypass. And I've just stood down as the um, chairman of the exam board, and I can tell you the candidates coming through do not know a great deal about cardiopulmonary bypass, and they probably should know a little bit more. So w we all know about the effects of bypass, and again, I don't want to sort of tread on the following speaker's toes, but there are various clinical effects, um, the most sort of devastating ones being uh, stroke and um, pulmonary edema, the hematological ones, the white cell activation, um, thrombocytopenia, hemolysis, and there are various inflammatory phenomena. And that's in addition to cannulation problems, decannulation problems, and training air, all that sort of thing that we see from time to time. Now, Ken Taylor, who you'll hear a lot about uh, tomorrow, did a lot of innovative research about the effects of bypass. And this is a pre-op um, 
MRI of the brain. This one was taken 30 minutes post-op. Okay, this is a routine set of coronaries. If you'd seen the right-hand side six days afterwards, the anaesthetist would turn the, uh, the ventilator off and say, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do for the patient. But this is, a, this is actually what happens to your brain half an hour after bypass. So there is a profound effect, not just on the brain, but on all the, uh, all the tissues. And most of the patients do absolutely fine. So, again, with the development of mini-bypass, and I know somebody's going to talk about mini-bypass, I'm very pleased to hear what the, the definition of mini-bypass is going to be, but the, the developments in mini-bypass have focused research on the various integral components of bypass, but what can be done to improve things, to attenuate the effects of bypass, and it's also led to um, various therapies for the devastating effects of bypass. And also the, um, the rise of mini-bypass has challenged a lot of preconceptions. And again, I, I know somebody's talking about what we should be measuring, but this business of setting the cardiac output, to me, doesn't make any sense. All those parameters were worked out on patients who were um, not anaesthetized, perfectly healthy, and they're not the patients that we deal with on a daily basis. And again, you don't need a huge oxygenator. I mean, if you're going to operate on an elephant, you need a big oxygenator. If you're going to operate on a 60 kilogram person, you do not need a big oxygenator. So how, how do we measure the adequacy of perfusion? But again, somebody else is going to talk about that. So the first things that we can do about making bypass a little bit safer is how we manage the suction, okay? And at the Hammersmith, we rarely use the sump sucker. We use the cell saver, put it back, process it and we get that sort of stuff back in the patient. If you leave the sucker in, churning away, without anybody looking at it, the stuff that actually comes out of the um, suction vent and back into the tubing looks like that. And you can guess that there's somewhere, even if that settles for half an hour, it's still gonna have a bit of gaseous embolus in it. Sorry, this slide hasn't come up uh, very well. Um, it's supposed to be a video. But again, if you concentrate at the top of this cone, you can see air bubbles. And this is active air removal. So it's not just a bubble detector. This is a bubble detector connected to a centrifugal pump. And as soon as it detects the bubbles, the bubbles are taken out straight away. And we used this for a while at the Hammersmith. And it was very good, because even if you got air in the, um, in the right atrium and you were in training air, it would just stop the pump, reset it, suck the air back out into the right atrium, uh, suck the blood out of the right atrium, prime itself, and off it will go again without you having to do anything. Now, if you get air um, in the venous line and you lose it to the perfusionist, you're there breaking the pump with a jug of water, trying to get everything back before you go back on bypass again. So things like this, when you've got a mini bypass circuit, to me, are actually safer than conventional bypass. Then again, if you look at, if you have retrograde priming, anti-grade priming, with conventional bypass, which is the blue line, you get huge swings in hematocrit for the first couple of minutes before it finally settles down. Whereas if you use mini bypass and proper um, priming, retrograde and anti-grade, you get very little swing in the hematocrit and you get a preserved hematocrit as well. Then again, other things, active venous drainage, so kinetic venous drainage, not depending on gravity. Gravity, Absence of a venous reservoir, I think, is a help. The automatic clamp, and again, we're sort of getting into artificial intelligence, if there is any in, uh, in theatres, but the, um, you know, if it detects the bubble, it'll stop, it detects bubble, it'll stop the, um, the machine and clamp the aortic line without even having to think about it. And also, as I said, cell salvage, developments in biocoding bio -coding and priming. And again, if we go back to the um, if we go back to the oxygenator, this is a standard oxygenator, and this is the surface that you need. Okay, with mini bypass, it's about four times smaller, and you can get perfectly good oxygenation with that. So why why do you need that? So for me, mini bypass, although it's not ideal, and you, there is a long learning curve it has challenged the preconceptions that we all labour under. And the results, there's less transfusion, there's less product use, there's less microemboli, both sort of particulate and gases, and there's less inflammatory response. 
and we believe it's better for the patient, but I think we need a trial to uh, actually prove that. Now, at the Hammersmith, um, we've done some experimental models, and this one is very neat. Now, I'm, I'm still not sure, I've been showing this slide for years, whether the toxin from this beetle comes from a sting or a bite, but wherever it comes from, if you put it on a patient's skin, you'll get a sterile blister. So if you then put the patient on bypass, activated white, cell, activated white cells will go into this blister and you can take them out and have a look at them without any other contamination um, of other activated white cells or platelets or red blood cells or what have you. So it's a very nice, neat little model um, that was uh, developed by Betsy Evans, I don't know if Betsy is here today, and, um, and Ken Taylor. And then we used that um, to do a, um, a trial between mini bypass and conventional bypass and looked at whether inflammation was um, more apparent um, in the standard bypass, which we believed, and yes it was. And there's the, uh, the reference if you want to look at that, and uh, Gianni Angelini supervised that trial. And again, using this model, we've been able to sort of suggest sort of attenuating the effects of bypass by using um, different components or by using various treatments. And one of these is sulfurophane um, pretreatment. Now, this is a compound that appears in green vegetables. And I put my name on this because I did suffer for this research. I had to drink uh, broccoli smoothies for five days, morning, noon, and night. And I can tell you, I was, there were six of us that did it, and I was in the group of three that didn't vomit every time that we did it. It was absolutely awful. But it did show that um, my, white, my, white cell count, uh, my white cells did not uh, react to an inflammatory stimulus after I'd had that. So the take-home message here is, eat more broccoli, do, do what your mother says. Okay, so um, th that's an innov innovative approach to sort of pre-treatment um, that may become um, standard practice, we don't know. And then th there are other things. I mean, at the Habersmith, we were big fans of a protonin, and um, Ken Taylor and his group did a lot of work on the adhesion properties of white cell counts um, on bypass, and there is, I mean, there's obviously uh, inflammation activated on bypass, and the white cells would become sticky, they'd start rolling on the endothelium, and they'd start migrating. But if you gave the patient a protonin, it would attenuate this effect, and the, um, the cell behavior was modified. So I'm going to finish off just by saying that cardiopulmonary bypass is safe, and the challenge is to keep it safe. Keep worrying, keep interested, and keep researching. And finally, I don't know if you guys know who this is. This is Sir Anthony McCoy, uh, or everybody knows him in Northern Ireland as Tony McCoy. He was a fantastic jockey. He was the champion jockey for about 20 years in the UK. And he's a legend in this part. But he, when he retired, he said, it's not about me. He said, I couldn't have done it without the horse. Okay, and I would sort of make a tribute to the perfusionists that we work with, because it's not about us, because without the perfusionists, We'd be nothing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I can answer questions.